What a blessing it is to uh, be here with you. Thank you for joining us to worship this morning. I'm so glad to be here. Scripture says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So may our time together this morning be an offering that is a sweet fragrance to our God. May our worship this morning come from humble and cleansed hearts. Scripture says, a broken and contrite heart he will not despise, so that our words and our voice be an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Right now, you guys, um, it's been a tough week, and it feels a little bit like the world is on fire, doesn't it? So what will we do? Well, we will do justice. We will love mercy, and we will, God helping us, walk humbly with our God. And we will tell of His loving kindnesses, for his mercies never fail, for they are new every morning. As we begin this morning, I'd like us just to spend some time in confession and, and praise and lifting up the Lord. So I hope you're in a good place, ready to do that. Would you bow and join me? Let's pray. Lord, as we come here this morning, we ask, would you forgive us for our ignorance, for our pride, and for our self-centeredness? For we do not see as you see. Who can discern his errors? Cleanse me from hidden faults. Also keep me back from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Lord, expose those attitudes in me that are destructive, that are condescending, that are murderous. Forgive me for bitter hatred, for contempt of soul, and for grieving your spirit. Lord, this morning, forgive us for prejudice in all of its forms, for arrogance, for vain finger-pointing, when we need your mercy for ourselves. Thank you, our great God, for Christ. He is our sacrifice. He is our satisfaction before your throne. He is the true light that comes into the world. He is our hope. He is our healer. And he has made us your children. We will tell of covenant love. We will sing of great mercies. Be glorified, Lord, here this morning by reigning in our hearts. Be glorified, Lord, among your people, wherever they gather today, and even with those of us who can't gather. Be glorified, Lord, throughout our nation. May your name be hallowed in our lives. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And now, Lord, our God, we ask, as a forgiven people and as a redeemed people, as a people who come solely on the basis of your grace through Christ your Son and his perfect blood and sacrifice, would you give us voice? Would you inhabit our praises? Would you be honored by what we do here? Meet with us now, we ask, for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, good morning. We miss everybody, but let's, let's worship together this morning. I see the King of glory. Coming on the clouds with fire, the whole earth shakes, the whole earth shakes. I see his love and mercy washing over all our sin. The people sing, the people sing. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna. 
Hosanna in the highest. I see a generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith, with selfless faith. I see a near revival. Stirring as we pray and see, we're on our knees, we're on our knees. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, heal my heart and make it clean, open up my eyes to the things unseen, show me how to love like you have loved me. breaks yours, everything I am for your kingdom's cause, as I walk from earth into eternity, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the high. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. The song of the redeemed arising from the African plain. It's the song of the forgiven, drowning out the Amazon rain. The song of Asian believers filled with God's holy fire. It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation, a love song born of a grateful choir. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. Let it rise. By the four winds, caught up in the heavenly sound. Let praises echo from the towers of cathedrals to the faithful gathered underground. Of all the songs sung from the dawn of creation, some were meant to persist. Of all the bells rung from a thousand steeples. None rings truer than this. It's all got children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all got children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all got children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, he reigns. He reigns, it's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah. He reigns, he reigns. The 
all the powers of darkness tremble at what they've just heard. Cause all the powers of darkness can't drown out a single word. It's all got you. Children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all got children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all got children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. Jeremiah 2911, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, say the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and hope. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah, the name above all. Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Body the bread, his blood the wine, broken and poured out all for love. The whole earth trembled and the veil was torn. Love so amazing, love so amazing. Messiah, the name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven. Messiah, Lord of Yes, 
Messiah. Name above all names. Blessed Redeemer. from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer. Rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. Dear God, we come to you this morning and we thank you for sending your son to be our Messiah. We thank you for your love for us and bringing us together as a body. In Jesus' name, amen. There we go. That was my fault. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 2 Samuel 23. Man, that was sweet to be able uh, to sing. Thank you guys so much. Actually, we're not even going to do a sermon. Uh, we're just going to sing that last song nine more times and call it good for today. Um, I would be super happy if we did that. Second Samuel 23. It is, um, it is rich just to come together in, in the place and under the banner of God's truth being sung. And then coming together in the place and under the banner of God's word being spoken and honored. So... Let's just pray again and join me as we invite that to happen in our presence, wherever we each are now. Our great God, would you glorify your name right here in our midst, in each of the places where we are? Right here and right now, would you come to speak for your healing, for your hope, for your help, for your conviction, for your comfort, for your encouragement? Would you come and do your will by your word? That's what we ask. Be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Samuel 23, we uh, come today to uh, the recitation of David's mighty men. We've met some mighty women in Samuel as well. Women like Ritzpah and Abigail and Hannah. But today we come to the roll call of David's mighty men, and it's a passage for us all. I thought much about this passage and prayed about it this week. wasn't sure if this was right given this week. But the Lord knows. I could wish maybe for a less violent passage in such a violent and contentious day as we are. But I rejoice as we come to this passage this morning in a God who knows well the evil of our world and he condemns it. One day he will judge it. I rejoice in men and women of faith who are strengthened by our Lord to bring deliverance and set others free as we find in our passage today. And I rejoice most of all in the passage we come to today in a God who is Lord over all, as we sang, and who makes of his people men and women of courage and of devotion and of renown and of grace. Let's take a look then together this morning at some of David's mighty men. First, let's see in this first group, in their courage... Let's see his strength and truth. In their courage, see his strength and truth. Second Samuel 23, pick up with me. We'll start reading in verse 8. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joseph Bashebeth, a Tachimanite, chief of the captains. He was called Adino the Yeznite because of the 800 slain by him at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there to battle, and the men of Israel had withdrawn, he arose and struck the Philistines 
until his hand was weary and clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him, only to strip the slain. Now after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hararite. And the Philistines were gathered into a troop where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot. He defended it and struck the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. Pause there. These are just the first three of the mighty men, and they are known as the three. They are the, the, those of greatest renown, those of, of highest honor of all of David's mighty men. And what deeds they have done, right? It says here of Joseph Bashebet, and it'd be nicer to just call him Adino, the other name we're given, because that's a lot shorter, that this one killed 800 men at once. And we think, well, well that's, you know, that sounds like a little bit of, of an exaggeration, right? Except when we realize that, that it's the Lord who used him and the Lord who empowered him. And God can do anything he wants. It would be crazy and unbelievable otherwise, but the Lord knows and the Lord is able. This is a small thing for him. What a deed. And then we hear of Eleazar and Shema. And each of these two are men in their own way who turned the tide. Eleazar, the others had fled and he rose up. Shema, the people again had fled and he rose up and he stood over a plot of ground. Each of these by their mighty work on that day a specific day that each of them had a particular deed they did, although I'm sure there are many others that aren't recorded here, they turned the tide of a great battle. We should understand something if we were to read this as an early Israelite, something that's here in the passage, but that we would easily pass over it. It says in verse 12 of Shema that he took his stand in the midst of the plot of lentils. Well, we need to know a bit about what the Philistines often did and other Moabites and Ammonites and other raiding nations nearby Israel in that day. They would allow the Israelite farmers to go out early in the spring season and they would do their planting and they would till their ground and turn it over. They would irrigate it and they would cultivate it and they would weed it and work it and water it all year long until it came time for the harvest. And then just before the harvest season, the Philistines would strike. And in so doing, what would they do? They would, they would march through the fields and they would consume everything that was theirs, ripe for the picking. And they would load up as much as they could carry. And then they would set fire to the rest of the crops. Imagine if you were an ancient Israelite. The first or second time that happened, the next year, going out to your field to plant your seed. Imagine the oppression that you'd be under and just the pain and the psychological torment it was to do all this work, not knowing if they would come again this year, whether or not any of this food that you worked so hard for would ever make it into your mouth, the mouths of your families. This is a picture of a people under a constant and a systemic oppression. It's good for us to resonate with that just a bit today as there are people even in our midst here in America today who I think rightly it can be said have faced a systemic oppression, maybe not even purposely, although at times very much purposely by some. A and we should resonate with the pain of their oppression and it should move us, it should move us to grief and move us to tears. Well, here are these, these three, Adino, Eleazar, and Shema. They have done awesome and mighty deeds. These are some, some one-man army kinds of scenes. Clearly, you don't take out an entire company without courage. And we, brothers and sisters, are in a world today that is in great need of men and women of courage, aren't we? But any fool can look brave. Any fool can pick a fight. Just check out your social media and you'll find a bunch who are doing that well. There are two things that we must see in this passage in order to read it rightly, in order to, to worship and apply it rightly to our lives. First, first are the most important words of this passage, and they really are those that guide our interpretation. They're found twice. First, notice what is said there in verse 10. He arose and struck the Philistines until his hand was weary and clung to the sword, and the Lord brought about a great victory that day. Drop down and find it again in 12. He took his stand in the midst of the plot, of lentils, defended it and struck the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. Who is it that's done the work here? The author has gone to lengths to make it quite clear to us to understand that the focus of the passage, though we're rejoicing in the renown of God's people that he's raised up, these mighty men, 
The focus of the passage is to look through these mighty men and see an almighty God. It is the Lord who has brought a great victory. And not just in these cases, but in each and every one of them. There is courage when we know that this is the Lord's battle. The question for you and for me is who are you fighting for? This week, as you look back on it, you might think of some times where your, your blood rose, when the veins came out in your neck, that you typed a little bit faster and a little bit more furiously in response. And you might ask yourself the question, who have you been fighting for? That's a question for you and for me as we come to a passage like this. If we humbly work and then we submit the outcome into his hands, then there is great courage. There is great confidence because we have an almighty God. And if we're fighting his battle, then the battle is the Lord's, not ours. The outcome is the Lord's, not ours. Who are you fighting for? Secondly, we need to notice something that's going to help us think about the right way to make application of this passage. It was in 1993 that I came across a sermon by Charles Spurgeon, and I read it. And, and I can honestly say it marked my life. He, um, he did a sermon just on this single verse, or maybe it's two, about Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite. And because of Spurgeon's sermon at that time in my life, I've never forgotten it, and he's become a hero of sorts in my own life. We've uh, had some animals named Eleazar, by the way. I don't know that they appreciated it at all, but nonetheless, I hope Eleazar will become a hero for you as well. I want you to notice what Eleazar does in verse 10, and then taking lead from Spurgeon, let's work towards application. It says, He arose and struck the Philistines until his hand was weary and clung to the sword. Why? Why did his hand cling to the sword? passage doesn't tell us. Commentators have their ideas. Probably the two leading options are first, either because of the blood that ran down over his fingers and onto his wrist and on his hand because of the dirt and everything else that coagulated and gathered and encrusted itself there. He, he couldn't get his hand out. So maybe they had to soak it uh, in something to clean it after all that had hardened. That's a possibility. The other option is probably my preferred option of understanding, though, and it is that his hand had so fatigued that he literally couldn't loosen his grip upon the hilt of his sword. If you've ever gone climbing or if you've known rock climbers, they've had this experience or you've had it where after using your forearms to make your way up that face, there comes a point where everything just locks up and you're just stuck like this and there's nothing else that you can do. Imagine clinging to that sword with all his might for hours, likely in the midst of this battle as he fought alone. It's here where Spurgeon's direction is instructive for us. Because if we want to apply this, we need to keep in mind, what is our sword? And as we've talked about for, before in Samuel, who are our enemies? Our enemies, for the most part, are not human beings. And our sword is not a literal sword, but it is the word, Scripture tells us. Specifically, it's the word of the gospel which is able to save. The question for us in this passage as we look to Eleazar and as we learn from him is do you and I cling to the word of God? Do we cling to the gospel? Is it our go-to place? Do we find when we're, we're not sure about the ground under our feet and we're having to make a difficult decision that we run to the cross? Do we find that we're in the midst of a, of a battle? Do we pause and step back and think, is what I'm really all about here is the, the glory of the gospel, the, the exposure of my sin and other sin, and, and the glory of, of the sin of forgiveness, I'm sorry, the grace of forgiveness through the gospel? Do I want that exposed? Is this where we run in a fight? Because this is our weapon. The gospel is, is the weapon for our fears that we're to cling to in that fight. It's the weapon when we have to fight against our own shame. And we say, devil, you're right. I'm a sinner. But I'm not ashamed because my God already knows and he's forgiven me. The gospel is our weapon when it comes to our witness and when it comes to our love. This is what we are to cling to until we cannot let go. Even were we to try, we find that it just, it just comes out of us. When we're cut, we bleed gospel. Listen to the words of Charles Spurgeon from, from that very message that I mentioned that was such a blessing to me years ago and pray it would be to you as well now. He says this, 
Every now and then some wise men think to convert me to skepticism. Skepticism was a leading philosophical thought of the day. Some wise men think to convert me to skepticism or whatever is very like it, some other modern thought. And they approach me with full assurance that we must give up our old-fashioned faith. They are fools for their pains. For we are at this time hardly voluntary agents in the matter. The gospel has such hold upon us that we cannot let it go. I could sooner die a thousand deaths than renounce the gospel that I preach. May we be men and women like Spurgeon, who when we're pressed into a corner, even in our own fears were we to forget what we know best, the gospel would come out of us and it would be what we would preach and speak and cling to. If you want to be a mighty man of God or a mighty woman of God, then it's going to take courage. But it's got to be the right kind of courage. It's a courage that comes out of God's strength because you fight his battles, not yours and not mine. It's a kind of courage that, that comes out of his truth because it's his gospel that gives us the right kind of courage. Yahweh acts through mighty men and women of God still today. The passage is telling us. But he does so through the gospel and through those who know that only the Lord brings a great victory. Their courage was great because their God, his strength, and his truth were even greater. Let's look at a second group of mighty men. And in their devotion, let's see his devotion. In their devotion, see his devotion. Pick up in verse 13. Then three of the thirty chief men went down and came to David in the harvest at the time to, to the cave of Ajulam. Now here when it mentions three, we're not sure if this is the first three or if it's a different three. It's, it's likely, looking at the wording, that it's a different three, part of that longer list that's going to come later, but we don't know, and it may or may not matter. But notice, now that you've, you've been caught up to speed as I have been this week, Notice what we get about the desperation of the time. It's harvest time. You know what that means when the Philistines come at harvest time. Three of the 30 chief men went down and came to David in the harvest time to the cave of Ajulam when the troop of the Philistines was camping in the, val camping in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold while the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. David had a craving and he said, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem which is by the gate. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water from the well of Bethlehem, which was by the gate. And they took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but he poured it out, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, therefore he would not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. David here is is in a battle. Again, the time is desperate. And the Philistines have a garrison in David's own hometown of Bethlehem. Here he is, maybe a stone's throw, maybe within sight of his own village where he grew up. He knows it well. He knows the streets. He knows the, this very particular well. He can taste its water in his mouth. And almost out of nostalgia, wistfully, he's, he's saying, oh, I wish I could just have some water from the well I know so well. It's an offhand comment overheard. But his mighty men love him. And in their devotion, they think, let's go. Let's go do this for our captain. And at risk of their lives, they break through the, the garrison of the Philistines just to fill a canteen and bring it back. Now, what happens next are pretty shocking. The key words are in verse 16. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. What David has done here, were it not for the explanation that follows, is one that's, that make a mockery of, of these men's work and, and of the, the sacrifice potentially of their lives. But because it's given us in explanation, it's not a mockery, it's just the opposite. It's profound honor. David says, be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this, that I should drink the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives. Do you understand what David is saying here? David saying, I'm not worthy even of this risk. I'm not, I'm not worthy of this devotion. I'm not worthy of your lives. I'm not worthy of this love. These men went because of their devotion to David. What we see in response is one of David's finest moments in the entire volume of Samuel. We see David's devotion to his men. When David is bad, he's terribly bad. 
But when David is good, man, he's incredibly good. See how his mighty men would do anything for him. That's what kind of men they were. They're loyal, but they know that he is loyal to him. I think of the chesed, of of God's covenant love, of his loyal love to his own children by faith through the blood of Christ, that he is devoted to them. When we see the devotion of his mighty men, we should understand that they rejoice in this moment at the honor he gives them to pour out the canteen and say, it's not even the water that I want. I love you so much, I'm not worthy. So he makes a a priceless sacrifice to the Lord. And I think their lives are marked by his devotion to them that day. Friend, do you know what the Lord has done for you? Do you know that the God of eternity and the creator of all things has come down to this earth? He has taken on the, the occupation of a womb. He was born as a baby. He, he lived a humble life. He, he subjected himself to the curses and the torment and the taunting and the torture of men and to crucifixion and death. And he rose from the grave for you. That's his devotion. If ever we find ourselves dull, we should meditate on his devotion towards us because that and that alone can stir the true devotion that God would have to make us mighty men of God and mighty women of God. You should meditate on the cross. I need to meditate on the cross regularly. Every time I sin, every time I need strength, every time I do something new, we should never get over the cross and over the Lord's devotion to his own. Third group of mighty men we'll see, picking up in verse 18. And from them, in their renown, see his glory. In their renown, see his glory. Verse 18. Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was chief of the 30. And he swung his spear against 300 and killed them and had a name as well as the three. He was most honored of the 30. Therefore, he became their commander. However, he did not attain to the three. Then Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done mighty deeds, killed the two sons of Ariel of Moab. He also went down and killed a lion in the middle of a pit on a snowy day. He killed an Egyptian, an impressive man. Now the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, and he went down to him with a club and snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. These things Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, did and had a name as well as the three mighty men. He was honored among the 30, but he did not attain to the three. And David appointed him over his guard. What we find is of these two more that are men, these two more mighty men that are mentioned is that their deeds have great renown. They have great fame. In fact, that's the key to understanding. That's the author's point here. Notice it's mentioned twice, and each time it's mentioned by two different words. Look at 14, pardon me, 18. End of 18, it says of Abishai that he had a name. I mean, he was famed. And then it says in 19 that he was most honored among the 30. Same things repeated of Benaiah down in 22, that he had a name as well as the three. And again, that he was honored among the 30. I know that these two didn't attain to the three, but the point is they have honor, they have a name, they have renown. And what we're to understand is that that bleeds over into all of the mighty men, is that they are those who are famous, but not in their own right. They're famous because they were faithful. They're famous because they were used of God. They are famous because of his fame and his glory. In their renown, we are to see his glory. Their renown is legendary and their names will never be forgotten. Here they are recorded in holy writ, recorded for all time. These names will never disappear. But The reason why is because they serve the Lord. Yahweh is able to give glory to his servants. Because he himself has all glory. He himself, when he is seen with the naked eye, will outstrip any beauty. He will be more massive, more awesome, more towering than anything else that has caused us to cower or to wonder or to thrill in all our, in all our sight. More than any beauty we've ever been attracted to. All his glory will reign. Yahweh says in Isaiah, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done. He knows all time because he is all glorious. As we see the renown of men like Benaiah and Abishai, 
we are to see a God of great glory who stands behind them. And we are to desire that. It is not wrong for us to desire reputation, to long for glory, even to want fame, provided it's in the right way, in the right time, and from the right person. All reputation is just a shadow of the glory that you and I were meant for. All renown, all fame, all respect is, is just a picture that points to the glory that God has made us for. Because he is the God of all glory. And all shades of good or bad, renown, reputation, and fame, all of them just point us back to his glory. Even in these mighty men, we should see that they serve an almighty God. Fourth and finally, as we come to the last list of mighty men, in their choosing, see God's grace. In their choosing, see God's grace. If we have time here, I'd like to read this last list. They're going to be for all eternity, so I think it'll be okay if we take 60 seconds and read them. Verse 24. Asahel, the brother of Joab, was among the 30. Elhanan, the son of Dodo of Bethlehem. Shema the Harodite. Elika, the Herodite. Helez the Paltite, Ira the son of Ikesh the Tekoite, Abiezer the Anathothite, Mebunai the Hushathite, Zalmon the Ahohite, Maharai the Netophathite, Heleb the son of Baana the Netophathite, Ittai the son of Ribai of Gibeah of the sons of Benjamin, Benea the Parathonite, Hidai of the brooks of Gaash, Abialbon the Arbathite, Osmaveth the Barhumite, Eliabah the Shalbanite, the sons of Joshin, Jonathan, Shammah the Hararite, Ahiam the son of Sharar the Ararite, Eliphalet, the son of Ahasbi, the son of the Maacathite, Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gilanite, Hezro, the Carmelite, Parai, Parai, the Arbite, Igal, the son of Nathan of Zobah, Bani, the Gadite, Zelek, the Ammonite, Naharai, the Berethite, armor bearers of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, Ira, the Ithrite, Garib, the Ithrite, Uriah, the Hittite, 37 in all. Thanks for letting me do that because now that seminary class I had on how to read Bible names has really paid its dues. Um, most of these names are names that this is the first and maybe the only time we'd ever hear them. We don't know much about them except for this place they have in this role. Besides maybe a couple of them that we know a little bit about that we've heard of in Samuel. But there are some that we need to pause and consider because... There's one in particular that the author puts in a place of prominence, one that we know very well. Were you a little shocked when we got to the very end of the list and we found Uriah the Hittite? What's he doing there? He's there in that place of prominence because I believe the author has put him last to shock us and to be reminded, just as we've been told so many times in Samuel, that the story of David's life is not at all about David. It's about the greater son of David. And if we've ever needed proof, even here when we talk about the, the mighty men of David and all their glorious deeds, we can't escape the fact that David himself was a sinner. And after all of this, this rejoicing and this honor and this, this hall of fame of names, we get Uriah the Hittite, which is the most profound reminder of David's most profound treachery. By the way, there is a second accounting of David's mighty men. It's found in, in the book of Chronicles. There are a few differences between that name and that list and this list. And that's likely because they were recorded at a different time. It seems that the list may expand over time. In any case, what you need to know is that Uriah the Hittite is buried somewhere in the middle of that list in Chronicles. But the author of Samuel has resurrected his name to put him here at the very end, out of chronology, so that we would be stunned. And we would say, are you kidding me? Uriah the Hittite, the one whom David so terribly, so treacherously sinned against, he was one of David's most trusted, most godly, most valiant men. He was one of his mighty men. Oh, but for grace. Oh, Lord God. Clearly, the passage is just once again giving us a reminder how we are to read about all of David's life. David himself was not chosen because of merit. He was chosen because of God's grace. And that's not the only snapshot of God's grace, I believe, that we find in this section. There are a couple other names that stand out a bit. Go back with me to verse 34. Eliphalet, the son of Ahasbi, the son of the Maacathite. 
The king of Maacah and his men fought against David in 2 Samuel 10. The Maacathites were enemies of Israel. They were pagans. They were worshipers of false gods, and, and they hated Yahweh and the Israelites. But apparently at least one of them, maybe as a result of that battle, I don't know, came to worship the God of Yahweh, came to serve Yahweh's anointed king. Sorry, I said the God of Yahweh. The God of Israel, who is Yahweh? You guys know that. Notice another one, verse 37. Zealot the Ammonite. You know the Ammonites are, are perennial enemies of the Israelites and of Yahweh. And here again we find one who's come from a pagan background to be in the very place next to the, the king himself, high up in the courts, very likely worshiping Israel's God. What do we find? Grace upon grace. That my name and your name, though we've rebelled, though we've loved our own way, though we've desired our own kingdom, Yahweh's won us over. In the choosing of, of Eliphalet and Zelech and Uriah the Hittite, that's possibly another nation as well, some question. And just the fact of all of the grief that comes across our hearts with Uriah. We're reminded of God's grace in his choosing of us. In their choosing, see God's grace. I pray, brothers and sisters, that we would be people of courage this week. That we be people of devotion. That we would rightly understand that it is appropriate for us to desire to be men and women of renown and of fame in the right way. But we can do all that and if we are not men and women of grace, then we will never be God's mighty men and women. For all of those other things, apart from God's grace, will be empty. Is your life marked by grace today? Is it so essential to you every day that it is your very breath in your life? Is it what you turn to, what you fall back on? Is it what you need more than anything else? We, if we're going to be mighty men and women and show the world an almighty God, need to be marked by courage, devotion, renown, and grace. Let's pray. Gracious God, our Father, this is what we earnestly desire for ourselves, for our children and our families, for our brothers and sisters and parents. This is what we desire for our neighbors and our friends, that they would be mighty men and mighty women of God. Lord, would you give us courage today in your strength, and in the truth of the gospel. Lord, this week, in all of our typing and speaking and thinking, would you give us devotion to you because you've so loyally devoted yourself to us? Lord, would you help us seek to be a people whose deeds are spoken one day, whose deeds are spoken of in eternity, though no one may see it, but just by faithfulness, we know that the host of heaven is looking on and the Lord Jesus Christ himself takes pleasure in our faithfulness, our love, our submission, and our humility. And may it move us to devotion. And Lord, would you make us a people of grace in all that we do. Oh, how our nation needs this. Oh, how our hearts need this. We love you. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me he is jealous for me loves like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath 
the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. We are his portion and he is our prize. Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If his grace is an ocean we're all sinking so heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my chest and i don't have time to maintain these regrets when i think about the way and oh how he loves us so God, your love for us. God, thank you so much. God, I pray that you would give us the grace and the confidence to show people that love this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. Before you go, if you would, wherever you are, would you do this? Would you stand with me right now? And let's um, receive all of us together, let's receive God's blessing in these words as we go. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may He, who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of His glory, blameless with great joy, the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, may He have glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.